At least 10,000 civilians have died in Gaza, and we have no idea at what point Israel will stop its relentless attacks. But even if the fighting stopped tomorrow, or next week, or next month, what then? Is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speaking to ABC News about how Gaza will be administered once the present fighting comes to an end? President Biden has said that it would be a mistake for Israel to occupy Gaza. Who should govern Gaza when this is over? Those who don't want to uh, continue the way of Hamas, it certainly is not... uh, uh, I think Israel will, for uh, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility because we've seen what happens when we don't have it. When we don't have that security responsibility, what we have is the eruption of uh, Hamas terror on a scale that we couldn't imagine. Now, those sentiments were repeated by defense analyst Avi Melamed on I-24, which is Israel's answer to Al Jazeera. Israel basically says, look, once we are done with crushing the major military spine of Hamas, we understand that it's not the end of the story yet because there will be remains, so to speaking. There will be cells. There will be an attempt to rebuild and to reactivate Hamas and Islamic Jihad military capacities. The idea is basically that Israel will not fully control the Gaza Strip following that, but basically Israel will have the free ability to operate in Gaza Strip to intercept, to hunt down, to catch um, uh, remains or cells of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and other. The presence of Israel in Gaza Strip post the crushing of Hamas military uh, spine will enable Israel more easily to to chase those people, to hunt them down, and basically to make sure that they will not be able to rebuild this whole infrastructure. Will that not lead to accusations uh, that Israel is occupying the Gaza Strip? It may lead to the accusations, but we, uh, but we have to remember accusation. But we have to remember that in the end of the day, it's not that Israel will be there solely alone. There will be other f- players on the ground as part of these arrangements of the post-war day, and Israel, as part of those arrangements, will be able to continue and to operate on the ground for intercepting, for hunting down, and for preventing the re-establishing of a military infrastructure of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. So Israel will remain active in Gaza, quote, hunting down Hamas, even after the war is, quote, over. But given thousands of civilians have already died, it begs a question. Will civilian casualties be accepted as legitimate collateral damage in supposed peacetime? And if so, and that seems inevitable, to what extent is it accurate to say the war is actually over? Um, Just quickly, if you appreciate our coverage on Israel's war on Gaza, then do make sure to like our video. It's a free way of making sure this video gets out to more people. Now, not everyone agrees on what's best to keep both Israelis and Palestinians safe. Here's James Schneider on Talk TV with his own proposals. But before he could relay his views, Nadine Dorries, who was presenting, said something truly extraordinary. Do you believe that if Israel now, what do you think would happen if Israel were to say now, okay, ceasefire, we are laying down our arms. I'll tell you what would happen. There would be another Holocaust. That's what would happen. No, what do you I'm think? Nadine. What do you think Hamas would do if that was the situation? Israel has to defend N- itself. Nadine, okay. And do you N- think they Nadine, can do that with okay. no casualties? Okay, Nadine, please don't say there'd be another Holocaust because you are conjuring up enormous fears, enormous understandable fears in Jewish people who have that absolute horror, that industrial slaughter, that industrial scale genocide. James, it's been reported they put babies in ovens. That's as close to the Holocaust as you can get. It's been reported that Hamas terrorists put Israeli babies in ovens. Okay, and I've I've also seen that somewhere else debunked, but I'm not going to get into the specifics of the claim. I'll come back to your central point. What should a statesperson-like leader of Israel do in response to the events of the 7th of October. First, they should... Okay, we're going to have to move on because we have to go into the break. So so if you just get... Because I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm not trying to cut you short, but mm-hmm. if you can... So first, they should have reinforced the uh, the kibbutz in, uh, in the Negev bordering Gaza. They Part of the reason there are not enough troops there to defend is because they're in the West Bank overseeing the ethnic True. cleansing of Palestinians there. And then the next thing to do is to sue for peace. And I know that sounds extremely difficult after horrible things are done, and it is extremely difficult. But the only 
long-term solution to this conflict is to end the dispossession of the Palestinian people and to have some form of settlement with all the Palestinian and all the Israeli political, political parties. That would lead to fewer deaths, both Palestinian and Israeli, in the short, medium and long term. James, we've got to go to break, but the two-state solution has been on the table for a very long time. The and people who won't sign up to it are Hamas. Uh, absolute so nonsense. It is ahistorical It would have nonsense. been in place. It is ahistorical nonsense, by the way. Before I go over to you, Moya, I, I want to clarify that. There has been um, a set of, you know, uh, peace agreements which have been broadly adhered to by basically one party since Oslo in the mid-1990s, and that is the Palestinian Authority. Every single day since the Oslo Accords, there have been illegal settlements being built. Every single day. While the Palestinian Authority do what they said they would do, and effectively, they are still tarred with the same brush as Hamas. Uh, they're still viewed as quasi-criminals by many people in European and American politics, and of course by the Israeli right, as I've already said, they are the people who dominate Israeli public life. And yet even somebody like Nadine Dorries, who's been in government, she's now on television, she can't get the basic facts right. Uh, Moya Schneider, Mr. Schneider, James Schneider, was exasperated when she was talking there, and understandably so, because it was quite abhorrent the kinds of associations and the kind of picture she was attempting to um, evoke. Is this a normal way to be carrying on? And is that a snapshot uh, in terms of the future of broadcast media in this country where everybody increasingly sounds like a even more hysterical version of Jeremy Carl? What do you mean future, Aaron? It's the present. It's right now. Uh, there is one thing that I do... That I've been thinking consistently across the coverage that has been, you know, shown of the Palestine crisis, and when I'm watching these shows, when I am watching the likes of James Schneider, the likes of Barnaby Rain, you know, people going on, the, you know, Yara Eid, the the Palestinian journalists who have managed to get through from Gaza and also the West Bank and be able to talk to. Western media. The one thing, I, there's, there's two things actually, I think. One is like, oh my God, I can't believe you have to endure these questions. The other thing, I am actually fucking glad. I'm glad at how stupid the line of questioning is because the answers and the eloquence that is given in return and the way that they are setting out you know, their facts and the reality of the situation in Palestine and the history is a huge education. And I'm glad that the right wing, you know, media, the centrist media in this country doesn't have people who are smart enough or respectful enough to do their research because it's really fucking showing now. And I'm sorry for swearing twice, but it's, they're really showing their ass. And what's good What's good about that is you watch these, you know, you watch these journalists, you watch these um, commentators come on and make the case and outline exactly what's happened and outline, you know, why there is what, what's happening with the occupation, what's happening with the apartheid state. And they bring their years of knowledge and learning. And you watch Nadine Doris say something ridiculous and you think, well, OK, well, Nadine Doris is ridiculous. And you're seeing that, I think, reflected in the way in British support for a ceasefire. I think you are starting to see um, how the broadcast media setup we have, where everything's entertainment and everything's, you know, this hysterical level does kind of fall apart, in my view, and doesn't have the same sort of power that it might have done to start these culture wars when it's an issue that is so clear and uncomplicated. Uh, and it's very much, OK, 10,000 people, 10,000 people have been killed in this tiny, densely populated, occupied territory where for years and years and years they haven't had equal rights. They haven't had dominion over their own futures, their own lives. They've been living as not even second class citizens, third class citizens in their own in their own space, in their own region that they've been and they've been displaced from homes over years and years and years by this other country. And now this other this other state, this other country is saying, well, you know, there was this horrible atrocity happened, but we have to kill 10,000 people to make it right. Plus, we're going to carry this on. We're not going to cause a ceasefire. And you look at that and you look at Nadine Dorries trying to make these arguments, especially to people, you know, like James Schneider, these Jewish individuals say, well, it's another Holocaust. And you watch them demolish those kind of arguments. And I think, thank fucking God that our media is so stupid. Mm -hmm.